Hi, this is Amy from Good Food on Earth, and my wonderful guest today is Rosemary Frey. Rosemary is, um, she had a master's of science in molecular biology, and she's an amazing investigative journalist and activist. Um, her articles have been published in Off Guardian and other news outlets. And today we're going to talk about the new variants and look at what the science is actually saying. So Rosemary, I'm going to let you uh, take it away from here. Thanks, Amy. And is it Amy? Is that how you pronounce it? Amy. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Amy. And thanks for having me on your show. And nice to meet you, at least virtually. Yes. <laughs> um, so I thought I wanted to just take a look at the papers, the modeling papers that talk about how very dangerous uh, the new variants are and how deadly they are and how they're going to escape vaccines, et cetera. And I thought, well, since all of our lives virtually around the world are now hinging on the, these new variants, I thought I should take a look. So I, I uh, looked at the three key modeling papers all out of UK um, in December 2020, one by Public Health England, another by uh, Imperial College of London and some from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Anyway, all out of, out of the UK. And uh, I looked at the papers and I noticed that pretty well, all three really hinged on three um, more basic science papers. Mm -hmm. So then I took a look at to say that, oh, it's, it's more contagious. So I looked at those three papers. Uh, it took me a little while to go to kind of compare all three of the modeling papers and to see, okay, these are the three central papers on, on the contagiousness. And there's another fourth one about how, well, you can tell, tell via the PCR test, the polymerase chain reaction test, you can tell via the PCR test that these are the, this is the new variant because it has a certain behavior that's slightly different on the PCR test. So I looked at those three papers on the fact that supposedly, or the supposed fact that these new variants, um, this new variant, the British one, B.1.1.7, the new variant um, supposedly binds more. And they're all done on just really hypothetical papers mm -hmm. in hypothetical kind of models. It wasn't anything even close to even seeing whether the, the virus, the new variant of the virus, and let's not, and I, for the purposes of this, article and maybe this discussion, I'm not going to get into the whole topic of whether that virus exists. I've dealt with that before. I'll deal, deal with it again. There are big questions about whether it exists. But I think for the purposes of general readers and people in general, isn't it interesting to look at the, the papers on the new variants and see whether there's their base, whether there's basis for it. So I um, looked at these three papers and they're all saying, well, in um, either just in, 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 um, in mouse cells, or in mice in one case, but always far removed from real life conditions. And so, so either in mice or in cells or in, in one, uh, one or two of the, pub, of the publications, they just took what's called the receptor binding domain, which is the part of the, the, part, of the part of the virus that binds to, is said to bind to the receptor on the cell that that will is the gatekeeper for whether the virus can virus can get into the cell. Mm -hmm. So there's one mutation or a, a mutation that happens is supposed to, said to have happened in the the gene sequence, the RNA sequence of the virus that alters the amino acids, which are the building blocks of the proteins mm -hmm. in this part of the receptor, in this part of the key part of the virus, and that change is said to make that that virus bind more closely, but it's, it's really pretty theoretical the way looked at, they looked at it. There's no real proof that it really makes a substantive difference. And in fact, and this is in my explainer video, also the one with the article. In fact, the, one of the scientists or one of those supposed key papers says, you know what, you can kind of mutate this receptor binding uh, domain all you want. And it's not really going to make much difference to the way the, the, uh, the virus binds to, this, to the receptor for the cell. Wow. So, yeah, so, so well, they're saying all oh, this one change makes all the difference and now it's going to bind more and uh, it's going to get in more and then it's going to, so it's going to spread like wildfire. And that's what mm -hmm. we're hearing. And that's, so there are these three pretty well theoretical papers that are then totally, what's the word, blown up, I guess, by uh, ramp, amplified by these modeling papers, which are total flights of fancy. They take something and they do a model on it. They do a model of that model and then another side model of the model, just totally divorced from reality. Here comes the dog, it's all good. And, um, 
And I, I think one of you in your article, you mentioned one of the authors that's involved in two of the papers, that's Neil Ferguson. <laughs> and I've just I posted today on my website an article about the conflicts of interest on the part of Neil Ferguson and also another key player in this, John Edmonds, mm -hmm. E-D-M-U-N-D-S. One doesn't hear his name that often or as often in uh, as Neil Ferguson in our circles, but um, when I was looking at who the players were and where the funding came from, something just told me to look up this guy Edmonds and it's like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. He is so connected. He's on all the same sort of committees that Ferguson is on. He's quoted in the media a lot as saying, oh my God, we have to stay home permanently or else the virus is going to get us. And we have to all get vaccinated while we're staying permanently at home or else the virus is going to get us. And his, uh, a spoiler alert, alert um, in my article I, sh I talk about, he, he was married to somebody who's a high up at GlaxoSmithKline. Mm -hmm. And also the Edmund, the department or the faculty that Edmunds uh, heads at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, it's hugely funded by the Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as is the whole of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and, and on and on and on. So there, and I quote an explosive paper that came out in German, uh, in, in a German news outlet two days ago, three days ago now, um, and I found it because it, my article was posted off Guardian and somebody mentioned this. It's a German article that talked about how Well, bullshit this modeling to make it look like the virus is very dangerous so they'll, they'll all stay home and that's a, and they found those scientists and i'm the same thing clearly has happened elsewhere including in england where they get these scientists who are guns for hire they'll give you bullshit modeling and scare the crap out of the population mm -hmm. and take whatever vaccines you want to give people so it's yeah. so transparent yeah that was um i think we we lost you for like you froze a little bit there but that was about the oh the Koch or the Koch Institute, right? In Germany. Oh yeah, you saw that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, no, no, wait, what were you saying? Um, so the, uh, I was watching, you know, James Corbett yeah. and um, they were reporting on their new world next week, um, how in Germany, uh, the Koch Institute or K-O-C-H, right. they hired um, scientists from there to make um, kind of make up proofs that would justify the draconian measures. That's exactly it. I didn't know yeah. the Corbett report was on it already. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. So, so the we've got Neil Ferguson and this is Edmondson. Is this Edmund Edmonds. Edmund Edmonds, and they've been part of the papers for the new variants or the models. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so a lot of people here, you know, trust the science and ah. and go with the science. And um, what I find interesting is, I know this is kind of scary for people to hear. There's a new variant, and mm -hmm. and new is like, oh, it's novel, it's unknown, and and the way the coronavirus narrative has gone on as well, um, just to pile on top of that. Uh, but I wonder if I could talk to you with. Um, your master of science in molecular biology, how scary normally is a new variant of anything that's, you know, going around? Uh, you probably know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not very scary, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. exactly. They just, um, mutations happen at everything and all, mm -hmm. it us all the time. And it's not like we become Frankensteinian and, and uh, and the cells are designed to um, to compensate for errors, and there's a lot of redundancy within the genome, so that can be compensated by the by the viruses themselves, you know, by the cells themselves, etc. So it's not; it's just completely. I I think of it as almost like it's like this, you know, whatever this is. This we are attached to reality, or what we in science or the narrative somewhat out there is attached to reality, and then with each little bit of just completely divorced from reality now without each little part added to the COVID official narrative. It just, now it's like, now, now that's so divorced, they can say anything. It's like, oh, it's gonna mutate. It's gonna, I don't know, start to eat people's nose hairs or something. And everyone just believe it. They're just so completely yeah. divorced from reality. And it's just. Well, I remember last year, I, like the stories that were seeded out, one of them, it was incredible because it was a real like news story. They were saying that for people who were taller, they were more likely ah! to get, yeah, like, so crazy things like that, but you can see how that could build on like taking people away from 
foundations of like the basics. If you just mm. look at the, the very simple information, understand the, you know, understand what science is, first of all, and then, and then look at, um, I, well, here, let me ask you, as a scientist, how do you look at data? Because I know you talk about this in your um, video for the new variants. Like, how do you, as a scientist and researcher, look at the data that's presented? Well, I don't know if I'd call myself, a, I'm not a scientist really, or a researcher. Like, I did my master's back in, I finished in 88, and I've been a writer since then. So I'm going to have a science background, and I was a medical writer, but, and I haven't, and a research, but not science. But I mean, I still, in my career, and just as a human, as a person who genuinely wants to know what's real and what's not real, you have to, you just have to read, don't trust any data, don't trust any source. You have to look for yourself. You have to look at the, the you know, like you probably do, you look at the, the newspaper article or whatever narrative, then you look at the sources, then you look at the sources of those sources and go as deep as you can until you've gotten the original information and then judge that and try to understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and then otherwise, because data is so meaningless, uh, otherwise it's just like, what is that? Um, that uh, just, you know, you could, how to lie with statistics. It's so easy. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. I saw that as a medical journalist that every paper I read was manipulated in some way because it was, it was funded by drug companies, which now rule the world, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, in, it's incredible. Um, I want to touch on with those new variants. I think the narrative that's going around is that supposedly with this binding thing that they're more transmissible. Right. And then I that supposedly because of that, we can't reach herd immunity. Now, I wonder if you could break down like, how does that make any sense? You know, it um, if there's a respiratory pathogen that's going around, a respiratory virus, like the common cold, and it's easily transmissible, if that's, if that's the data people are, the story they're getting, um, with a very low infection fatality rate, then how does that play into herd immunity not being able to be achieved if it's more transmissible? Well, they say, which is completely yeah. divorced from reality, that... Um, because it's a little different, then it'll escape the vaccines. So no matter how much they vaccinate us, then it, the vaccines won't work. And we all know that our immune systems can't function for themselves, that all we have to rely on vaccines. So if we, the vaccines won't work, then, oh my God, we're just gonna, this, we're just gonna be totally susceptible to this, this, these different types of the, the virus, which is all obviously completely untrue that, uh, that um, the immune system, you know, if the virus exists, then it, our immune systems are well equipped to uh, to deal with it. And the more we're exposed to it, the the more the better we're off we are, because we'll be we'll remember it the next time we we encounter it, and we'll, we'll, we'll it won't bug us. And um, so, and the whole concept of herd immunity is kind of is not mm -hmm. it's not really valid either. It's just you know just like measles or whatever you encounter a, a pathogen and you you deal with it and it's bye bye and it's good for you for the rest of your life. You don't have to doesn't affect you but they're yeah. just twisting it every which way that they just you know they were just might as well just get hooked up to a little have a little needle in your arm permanently so they can just go by every hour and just mm -hmm. get a new vaccine that's the yeah. whole goal well i think some of the scariest things that i came across when i was doing my own research was from like mit tech um where they would they wanted to give you a vaccine that was a multi-dose so it would actually be remote controlled and you would get one vaccine, but it had multiple doses. And then the idea was that, you know, they could release it when it was right to release it. It's kind of interesting that some people like that's the direction they want to go. But have you, but, did you read the paper that's based on, or is that just something you read like second, third, third hand? Like it was, um, I looked at, it was from MIT tech. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. but that was, um, I'll dig it up for you, but that was um, last year. I think I've I saved it, so I can okay. send wow. it to you. But it's just, I, I could see, you know, where that some people want to go that direction. It's like, you know, if, sure, why not? You know, just if you want to have like a an IV drip with you all the time, well, maybe we'll just put a little microchip in there that's got multi-dose, cool. you know? 
Um, but yeah. And that's biogel. They talked about biogel. Oh, that was in a Corbett report thing on the future of vaccines, but I haven't looked mm. at the original sources. So they'll put the stuff in biogels and it can just be. Yeah, 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 yeah it's please. interesting. Yeah. But yeah, so I want to, um, and actually before I show your website, because I, I'm really happy you have one now so that all of your stuff is together um, and people can like um, uh, see all your interviews and articles and your blog, which is amazing. Uh, but I do, I want to mention how I discovered you is actually through watching James Corbett and he played a clip when you were um, talking, um, I believe it was in uh, Toronto, maybe, or Ontario, uh, regarding the vaccines. So you actually have moved into um, an activism role. And I wonder if you could just touch on why um, you decided to do that. Well, actually, I've been an activist for a few years. I was first really more on the environmental side, and I protested pipelines. I was really into that for a while, not so much anymore. Uh, and then, you know, would protest trans rights, which I I don't have, to, I've written about that too. That's another mm -hmm. huge boondoggle. Um, so, and then a friend of mine who's, I know from activism said, told me maybe three or four years ago, she said, Rosemary, you should look into vaccines. So I did, because I really hadn't looked at them, into them. Uh, an editor of mine that I talked to, God, I, we're talking at least maybe 20 years ago, I talked to, asked him about Andrew Wakefield and aluminum and stuff. He said, oh no, vaccines are safe and effective. And then I just, I believed him. That was it for 20 years. Oh my God. So, um, but, so I looked into it and I, if there's really good information out there um, saying, wait, Andrew Wakefield was framed. Mm -hmm. um, there is a connection in some children between autism and vaccines. And there are many vaccines that are not universally safe and effective. And so I'm just, I'm just used to being an activist. So when our board of health here in this, at the city of Toronto decided they were going to propose to ban any information anywhere about any problems with any vaccines, it's like, what? So a few of us went to speak against that at city hall. When we had, when we had the meeting, we, we had our little time to talk. And then the following September, the following, um, that was in April, 2019. And then a few months later in September, 2019, dozens of us came to uh, do the same thing. And it was the same, same silence from the Board of Health members saying no, and they were saying vaccines are safe and effective. And, but anyway, I, we have a duty to show up and stand up when there's such, when you know one of the Board of Health members, who's also a progressive, um, said many people were in it when we were talking to this meeting in September 2019, were saying there's such a thing as bodily autonomy, the right to decide which Um, uh, he said, he probably, uh, Corbett probably saw that because I wrote that in another article and then James, I, you know, did a great thing with it, um, said, no, there's no such thing as bodily autonomy because I'm an environmentalist. So I know that there's so many pollutants out there right now that every time, as soon as the baby takes its first breath, its body is invaded by pollutants. So there's no such thing as bodily autonomy. <laughs> bad, really bad. So yeah. it's bad. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we're at this point now. It's it's kind of interesting where yes, we're all connected and maybe there's some people who are just kind of waking up to the fact that we're all connected. Mm -hmm. But that's not a scary thing and that doesn't deny you your freedom of choice, your free will. Like there there's that that nuance there that some people who are just waking up to the fact that we're all connected in this world there's a fear now, like, oh my gosh, like these things are, you know, there, if I, if I do that, I'll, I'll give you an example. It's like when I was looking at the religions in India, when I was traveling there, there's a religion mm. called Jainism mm. and they believe so much in like um, the principle of not doing harm, but it's almost to the point of negating their own existence Wow. because they won't eat anything unless it's like, say if it's fruit in the tree, unless it's fallen on the ground mm -hmm. and they're always sweeping in front of them. So they don't step on anything, but it's, it's, what's interesting is, um, you know, it, it's, it's almost seen, uh, a very definitive thing of what is like bad. Like if you step on something on accident, then somehow that's really bad and for your karma. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, 
Yeah. It's like, well, what about you? You, you as a human being, you are nature. You're, you're, you're not like separate from it. It's all one and the same. And there's a reason why it works the way it does kind of thing. Mm. So, yeah, but let me show your website because um, I'm really, there's some amazing stuff on here that I think people should look into. You can see my new article. It's under new articles on the little uh, pull down menu there. Yeah, I've got that set up. I've got, here we go. So this is the one that we were just talking about on the new variants. And there's this really awesome uh, nine minute video that you did to outline it. And then you just go into the details, which is fantastic. Um, and we've got here, yeah, your other new article on the modeling paper, Mafiosi. And there's one other um, article that I've been sharing a lot as well. And this is um, the one you, where you talk about what happened in the long-term care and nursing uh, home. Yeah. Cause that, I think a lot of people are un still unaware about and it's, um, here we go. Let's, yeah. So that's something to look into. Um, and we've got your interviews and the blog and yeah, it's just really, oh, really I had a friend do that. I tried it myself and it, oh, so he helps me. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> not easy doing all this stuff. Yeah, no, Nobody else is awesome. doing the videos for me like they film me and then they yeah. So mm -hmm. it helps. Yeah. And so what I like, I'm gonna um, just want to say for my audience again, what I really like about what you do with your writing is um, you cite things, you know, and, and people <laughs> like like the way it should be done. Um, you cite it so people can go and look at the original sources themselves and come to their own conclusions, which, you know, is, is what we should all be doing, I think. Yeah. Because I want to know if I'm wrong. If I cite something yeah. that's wrong, I'd like to be told and that I'll, because I don't know, I don't see the point of leading ourselves down blind alleys. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I'm, are you still on Twitter? Yes. Yes. Okay. So people can follow you on Twitter as well as at Rosemary Frey. Yeah, at Rosemary Frey, T-O. T-O, okay, yeah. awesome. Oh, yeah. by the way, the name, what does it say my name on there? It's not really my name, but. Where's that? Oh, Canty, yeah. Yeah, it's my <laughs> girlfriend, so. Okay. I'm Rosemary. Yeah, uh, well, I'm going to have the links um, in the description, the video description. So we'll have your website and your Twitter. Um, and is there any other things you want to mention before we, we end here? No, I, I'm just, well, I'm curious, what's, is, do you have a science background or you seem? Um, well, I'm, I'm kind of a self-taught person. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm training as a health educator, cool. but otherwise uh, I just love learning. So I, I, I do what you do with everything. I, um, there was a point where I was like, well, how do I know that this is true? So you dig in and you dig in and you dig in and you break things apart and you take it apart and you try to find like, where was the starting point? And, and it's, it's just kind of something that's fun and um, exploratory, but I do that with everything. So that's yeah. That's great. That's yeah. the way to be. And then keep you know, read books and stuff mm -hmm. on everything like I do and just keep this. It's never ending, which is, yeah, it's very satisfying, even though it's like brutal and, and depressing, but. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, when I did start looking at, um, like you mentioned, with the published science articles, and mm. I, I noticed right away the manipulation of language is mm. I'm, I'm pretty um, language composition is a big thing for me. So I can see where they play around with um, wording so that they give you an idea, or there's manipulations of language so that you you as the average person might be too bored to read it. So your mind kind of shuts off and then you miss something mm. so, like they cover things up in that way. It's just really interesting. Mm. And it was frustrating. It's like, well, my God, like I, I need, I know what this is saying, but now I got to break it down to show somebody else what it's saying because it's so like, just so um, heavily manipulated. Not all of them are, but you know, there's some in there that are, hard to dig through yeah. yeah you have to kind of what do you mean by you know what it's saying like you're saying it's so mm -hmm. poorly written or there's it's like not really true um the language composition so um it's i i don't know how to, so it's it's the position of the way that things are worded it's kind of hard to uh describe but you can um 
set up, say you set up a paragraph in such a way that um, the easiest thing to read is the message you want everybody to take from that, or you make that the first thing and then, you know, nobody else reads the rest of it. But then there's um, ways that they'll use uh, wording so that it sounds confusing when it's really not. Oh, interesting. You know, it's yeah. just, um, it's kind of, in yeah. So I'm, it's one of the things that I noticed with, uh, it helps to, it's kind of a mind control thing. And um, I, it's something I'm trying to, I'm going to try to write a, a presentation on right. uh, for awareness, because this is also a tool I think we can use for recognizing how to do strategic effective communication because mm. there are certain what they've done with this narrative is they've embedded trigger words so if you touch on any of the trigger words the person you're talking to they automatically shut off mm. but if you are able to go around that you can actually connect with them human to human mm. and kind of you know they they recognize our commonality instead of emphasizing mm. all the differences that's Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So can yeah. you put me on your email list or should I how do I sign up for your email list? And um, I don't have an email list, but I'll put you I, I'll send you um, an email when I've got updates. So okay. I'm, I'm subscribed to you. <laughs> what was that? I'm subscribed to you. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that it goes through MailChimp and MailChimp is challenging, but mm -hmm. it's the best thing out there, I guess. I yeah, I, I guess so. Um, yeah, so that's great. Um, anything else you want to leave us with? Uh, no, I just hope to chat with you again and learn from you and learn from each other and uh, learn from everybody together. And, get and one, one last thing I want to mention, you do some work with Vaccine Choice Canada. Is that right? I, I, I are you I'm not you a member, but I, I mean, I'm very, I guess, in touch with them all the time. They're good people. And okay. Uh, yeah, because I, I saw in one of your interviews that you were with them. Have you done any interviews with them recently? Um, I mean, I was briefly a member. On their uh, website and I um, and I when was I a member? I don't know. It's been a while, I think. And uh, just it would exchange information, I guess. All right. Yeah, because it's, it's great that we can network together because there's so I know there's a lot of people trying to push back and there's different movements. So I'm hoping a lot more people will get it, you know, get your work and make use of it. And, you know, we can uh, all work together to stop what's happening. Right. Yes, yes. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank Great you so you. much.